Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear all SISNI members, participants, Assalamu alaikum and very warm welcome to this webinar arranged by Saudi Society for Medical Education, Riyadh Office. I'm Dr. Shazi Iqbal, chairperson and organizer for continued professional development activities at Saudi Society for Medical Education. You know, these days, artificial intelligence is a growing phenomenon and it is facilitating a wide scale of organizations, professions, including medical education. And for us as a medical educators to be properly prepared for AI, we need to have fundamental knowledge of artificial intelligence in relation to learning and teaching and the extent to which it can impact medical education in future. Being medical health professional trainers, we need to consider the impact of artificial intelligence on medicine and its impl implications of um, and impact on future medical doctors and training. So today topic is very interesting, role of artificial intelligence in medical education. And I'm sure that a lot of participants, they had been waiting since long time for this topic. And I'm very much honored and delighted to present our distinguished speaker, Dr. Daniel Salcedo. Very warm welcome, Dr. Daniel, to Sesame Riyadh Office, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Daniel Salcedo is MD. He is MHPE from Institute of Health Professional, Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston. He is an expert medical educator, simulation specialist, and educational technologist. He has ample experience in simulation-based teaching, assessment, research with a strong interest in educational technology development, integration, evaluation, including extended reality, artificial intelligence, remote learning, and game-based learning. Currently, he is working as director of Simulation Center and eTech at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, USA. Previously, he served as a director of clinical education and director of research innovation at Tappi Municipal Wen Fan Hospital, Taiwan. He is author of various researches on role of artificial intelligence in simulation as well as in medical education. So we are very much honored to have him today on Sesame Riyadh office. Very warm welcome again and very warm welcome to all participants. Uh, I shall be moderating this session and this session will be recorded and we shall share recording of this session later on. Uh, and uh, you can ask your question by end of the session and I will be keeping eyes on chat box. And uh, uh, Dr. Daniel, now the uh, floor is yours. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the lovely introduction for all the effort to arrange this session. I, I really, it's, it's an honor to, to be able to, to join you today and to talk about something I'm really passionate about, which is uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, this is, uh, artificial intelligence is lovely because it's a terribly misunderstood technology. Everybody has heard about AI, but very few people are able to explain what AI is and what it actually does. So hopefully today we'll have a chance to, to talk a bit more about this technology, you know, how, what, what is the role of this technology in the future for us? And I, I'm looking forward to, to receiving your questions as well. So please do make sure to ask any questions. If we cannot answer them here, I'm happy to continue this conversation online uh, at some other time so that we can, we can talk a bit more because this is very, very important for the future. So, um, with that, uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, a little bit of what we do here in, at Case Western and tell you a little bit about who we are. So uh, let me just click this here, great. So uh, this is uh, Cleveland. So Cleveland is, is a lovely city, a bit on the cold side. Uh, we do get quite a bit of snow in the winter, but it, it does have its lovely days as you can see over here. Um, this is our campus at Case Western University. It's a combined health professions campus where we have uh, medicine, we have the nursing school, we have the dental medicine school, all together under one roof with the idea of being as interprofessional as possible. So as I talk today, I'm not only going to talk about medicine, but let's talk about health professions in general. Uh, this is our, our neighbor is the Cleveland Clinic, which is uh, located right next door to our building, and we collaborate extensively and that's where our students do most of their clerkships and clinical experiences. And, uh, and they, of course, also have their own medical school that is housed under the same building. Uh, this is what our campus looks like inside. It's a quite, it looks like an Apple store, to be honest. It's kind of interesting. Um, 
And this is where I work. This is the simulation center where I, where I, that I'm in charge of. Uh, we do all kinds of simulation uh, and we, we develop new technologies for, for improving the way our students is learning. And AI is a big part of what we're looking at as, as something to develop in the future. Uh, and yes, we do have a helicopter inside a building, which is very strange, but it's, it's part of what we need for, for our training. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare 4.0 and how that is affecting health professions education. We're going to be talking about you know, a little bit more about what AI actually is and what it's not. Uh, we are going to be talking about the difference between AI education and AI for education, because there are two very important areas we need to be aware of. And also we're gonna talk about, you know, well, how, how do we develop AI competency in our students? And what is the role of this technology in, in general for us as educators? So this is kind of our goal for today. We're gonna to be discussing some of these. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to post in the chat and then later we can address those. And I might ask you some questions and I would appreciate if you could answer on chat as well. So we can, we can kind of make this a bit more interactive and it's not, not just me talking all the time. Uh, if I do start speaking too fast, please, uh, Shasia, please, please feel free to stop me and let me know I will slow down. Yeah, Are sure. we okay so far? So far, it's quite well. Excellent. Okay, sorry, I apologize, but this is my passion in life, and I get very excited when I talk about it. Okay, so let's talk about technology in general. So technology has evolved very rapidly over, over the last few years. We've gone from, from the first the start of what we call the industrial revolution in, in the 17, in 1784 to what we have today, which we're at a point called industry 4.0. And this is, has a series of elements that are unique and technologies that are unique to this industry, including for example, cyber physical systems or the usage of internet of things with connected devices and networks. So this is what happens in general in the industry. And let's take a look just very briefly, maybe go through a little step-by-step uh, step of what this looks like. So this was the uh, Industry 4 1.0. This is a car industry Ford in the United States and everything was done manually, right? And the cars had to be pushed around as they were being built. Then after that, electricity came in and we, we were able to automate a little bit more of the functions, right? We had conveyor wheels and then people would work on specific components that would be placed on the car later. Fast forward, forward to Industry 3.0 and then you know, we started using computers and robots to, to support uh, what, what the mission was, whether whatever industry was, this particular is the car industry. But now with, with Industry 4.0, we're seeing a whole new group of technologies emerging, right? And we're talking about technologies like artificial intelligence, we're talking about precision robotics, we're talking about uh, all these kind of internet of things, right? So all of these things are, are coming together and have created a completely new revolution within industry. So I'm showing you cars and you're probably wondering why is this guy talking about cars is simply because I want to create a parallel with what's happening in healthcare. So in healthcare, industry 4.0 is driven by a group of five basic technologies. One of them is artificial intelligence where we're gonna be talking about today. The second, the second technology that's driving the healthcare industry revolution is the use of big data. And uh, I think you know, we've seen how this has really had a huge impact on how we're planning services today. COVID, for example, really brought this to a whole new relevance. Uh, the internet of things and the use of interconnected devices, for example, many of us uh, wear these kind of Apple watches today and you know, we're able to get heart rate information and your body weight and different things stored in these devices that can exchange data. Uh, we're using much more precision robotics and we've seen a lot of this develop not only in surgery like the Da Vinci robot, but for example, we look at the way pharmacies uh, are using robots today uh, to complete many of the tasks, right? And these are precision robotics. They're robots capable of doing things that human beings would not regularly be able to do. And then finally, the last big technology that is producing changes in the healthcare industry is extended reality, right? The use of AR and VR uh, into clinical care. And for example, how we visualize data or for interacting with CT images in a 3D environment and all these different things. 
So this is what's happening in healthcare. Now, the big question we need to ask ourselves is, you know, is this really also happening in education? Are we seeing these changes as well? Well, one would probably argue that education has been slow to adopt new technologies. And we're always a bit behind the industry in terms of bringing these new technologies into what we do every day. Uh, and there have been significant changes. Like if we think about it, um, when I was a medical student, these were the tools I used to learn. So I had to carry the Harrison's uh, Internal Medicine, which was two very large books that I had in a backpack. And I had a notebook for my notes. And we used these little slide carousels. Just quickly in the chat, does anybody recognize this device? Yeah, has anybody seen one of these before? You put the slides in and it goes in and out and it projects the image. Yes, Muhammad says yes, yeah. Okay, seeing lots of yeses there. Okay, great, yes, so some of us have seen these technologies before, but it's not a technology that our students would recognize anymore, right? Because they work with a completely different set of technologies that are the ones that they use for learning. Many of them have their phones all the time, they have tablets, they, they're using social media, right? They're, they're using AR, VR, um, AI is being involved right now. So the technologies that our students use for learning today are extremely different from the technologies that we were trained with, right? And, and this it's, it's really challenging for us as teachers to, to think, oh, okay, how are we going to start using these new technologies to support learning? Because we cannot keep going the way we were going. So a lot of it is about learning to, to to integrate these technologies. I love that comment from Professor Khalid, very funny and useful machine. Yes, it was useful. Okay, very good. So th basically there's a big change in the technology that our students are expecting. And we need to see how can we start matching those standards and expectations. So let's talk about AI in a little bit more depth because many times we've all heard the term AI multiple times. But when it comes to really understanding what AI actually is, things are not so clear. And there are several reasons for this. The first one is that there's a lack of consensus in the definitions of, it, of AI. So people feel that AI is different things depending on who you ask. If you ask somebody in the software industry or you ask somebody in the healthcare industry, you will get a completely different answer. The second thing is that there's been a lot of differences in public perception of AI. For example, we've seen AI in movies, and for example, sometimes the AI in the movies can be an evil AI that's going to destroy humanity, right? But also it could be like something that is going to automate the world. Or, so there are many different ways in which we show AI, which also affect the way we understand it. Uh, marketing also, like for example, uh, if you've attended a conference recently, uh, every single product that they want to sell you says that it has AI. There's some AI in the product. And, and many times you don't really understand what that AI does or if it's useful or not, but everybody has something AI. It's a trend, right? And then finally, there, there are cultural perspectives that also modify our, our view on, on, on AI technology. For example, like if you are somebody who's not very in tune with technology, then the concept of AI might seem very alien to you, right? So, so then these are important things that we need to do. But basically, we need to understand that AI is not better than the human being. It's just different. What an AI and what a human being would interpret as easy or difficult can be very different. Let me give you an example. So if we look at the, this, this equation in the upper left, right? We have a big number to calculate. If we wanted to calculate that just using our brains, that would be extremely difficult to do for us, right? On the other hand, for the AI, this would be an incredibly easy task, right? Because AIs think in numbers. It's very easy for them to, to, to calculate a number, right? On the other hand, if we asked somebody to pick a random object from a table, for the human being, it would be very easy. We just stretch our hand, we grab it, and we pick the random object. But for the AI, it would be almost impossible to decide which object to pick up. You know, well, how, how can it make that decision? What are the parameters? So the AI would have a terrible time trying to, to pick up a random object. 
So we need to understand that AIs are not going to take over humans. AIs can work together with humans to help us in the things that we find difficult to do while still be able to perform the tasks that we are better at. So AI is about a partnership more than a competition. So th these are a couple of things that we want to keep in mind. Um, we're, just to give you some examples of definitions of, of AI, we, we have the Encyclopedia Britannica talks about AI being something that performs tasks commonly, commonly associated with intelligent beings. No, that's very wide. That could be anything, right? Or according to IBM, basically AI mimics the problem solving and decision making capabilities of the human mind, right? Or according to Oracle, which is another technology company, uh, it mimics human intelligence to perform tasks and can improve itself by doing these tasks. So there are a couple of very interesting elements that we can see are common in these definitions. One is that they perform human-like tasks, right? That's one of the elements that we have there. The second thing is the machine is capable of doing of making its own decisions, right? So that's another really important element to understand. And then finally, these systems have the ability to improve themselves based on what they're doing. So they're self-learning. So these are some of those key elements that we really need to keep in mind as we discuss today about more about AI. Now, there are two key concepts that, that I would like us to, to, to be familiar with. One is the, contest, the concept of autonomy, right? The one in green. And basically autonomy is the ability to perform a task in a complex environment without guidance. So being able to perform your task without somebody telling you what to do. And that's one of the key features of AI. So AIs are able to perform the tasks without the human having to tell them to do the task. The second element that is a key concept of AI is the adaptability of the system. So the ability to improve the system's performance by learning from its own experience. So these systems become smart the more they perform their job. So as the system repeats its job, it becomes better at it. So those are the two elements that distinguish something as an AI against non-AI. The ability to operate independently and the ability to improve themselves by learning. So those are kind of like the two basic concepts that I would like to keep in mind. So what we're gonna do is with this in mind, I wanna play a little game with you. Okay, we're gonna decide if something is AI or not AI. And I'm gonna ask you to please reply in the chat. I'm gonna give you an example. And in the chat, I would like you to tell me if it's AI or not AI. Okay, so let, let's go with our first example over here. My first example is a complex spreadsheet that can calculate financial data based on multiple data sources. So a spreadsheet that can calculate financial data on based on maintenance. What do you think, AI or not AI? So we're seeing some different answers here. Some AI, some people say no, some yes, some no. Okay, we have a, a kind of a, some mixed opinions. Okay, so let's go back to our original idea. So the first thing is, does this spreadsheet perform the task by itself? Do spreadsheets perform tasks by themselves? Well, usually we, we need to dictate the data. We need to give them the data so that the spreadsheet can calculate things. So if we look at it from that perspective, maybe not so AI. But now the second element is, can the spreadsheet improve itself by calculating numbers? And that's where it fails, the AI test, right? The spreadsheet is not able to change its programming or improve itself. We need to change it. So we can improve it, but it cannot improve itself. So in this particular case, a spreadsheet that calculates financial data would not really qualify as an AI because it cannot improve itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so that's kind of more or less the idea. Okay, let's try another example. Let's try another example. Okay, AI or not AI? A music recommendation system that suggests new music based on the user's listening behavior. So a system that is suggesting new songs 
based on the songs that you have heard before. And we can see that there's almost a unanimous yes for AI. And all of you are correct. Gold stars for everybody. Yes, this is correct. This would be a true AI, right? The system will automatically recommend new things based on what you've been doing. So this system is learning from your behavior, from your preferences, right? And it's doing this automatically. So this is definitely a good example of an AI. This is an AI that is suggesting new music. Okay, here I have another one for you. So an application that automatically enhances photographs. So you give it a photograph and it's going to make the photograph better. Is this AI or not AI? Okay, so I have to admit this was a trick question. The answer is, I'm not sure. Uh, some of them have been using some elements of AI. Uh, it might not be completely AI in itself, but for example, like if we look at uh, an application like, like uh, Photoshop, Photoshop actually collects data from, from photograph collections and uses that to process future images. So there is a learning component in it. So, so this would be a good example of something that is kind of in between. We're not a court, we're, we're not too sure about whether this is an AI or not. So again, when we look at an AI or somebody tells you, oh, this is an AI product, then we need to ask ourselves those questions, right? So is this really an AI? Is it able to learn by itself? And two, is it able to operate by itself? And if we understand these basic concepts, it's easiest for us to understand what is AI and not AI. So thank you all for participating. I'm, I'm really happy to, that we could get some really good opinions and we're all finally on the same page. Um, so again, is all the AI the same? Well, no, there are different levels of AI. Uh, it can go, for example, we can classify it as narrow artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. The narrow one is what we have today that can perform very specific tasks. For example, diagnose uh, an X-ray, right? Or we have general artificial intelligence, and this is the idea that something that can do everything. And this is definitely not where we are today with, with the technology. On the other hand, we also have the concept of strong and weak AIs. And we know that a weak AI is you know, a machine that has some intelligent behavior, but it's just a computer. Whether a strong AI would be something that is really self-conscious. And again, these are not areas that we have reached yet. No, mostly at the stage of narrow artificial intelligence and weak AI is what we, we have available at this moment. Now, how does it work? Well, AI works in a very simple manner. Uh, it all starts with some data being inputted into the system, right? This data is processed, right? And then there's an outcome from the data. Uh, once this outcome is achieved, then the system assesses that outcome and makes adjustments to improve itself, right? And these adjustments can happen at any level. It could be adjustment changing the type of data, could be an adjustment in the way the data is processed, or it could be an adjustment in the outcome that it's producing from that data. So the idea with the AI is that it's able to assess and adjust in order to improve its function. And that's a very, very important part of what we would call an AI. Right, so the ability to improve itself. Um, let's, let me just quickly. Oh, sorry, what happened here? I lost my mouse. Oh no. Um, great. Uh, a lovely time for PowerPoint to crash. I think uh, AI was angry that I was not saying nice things about it. So just give me one second. Let me open my presentation again. I'm not sure why this happened, uh, but just a moment, please. Yeah, this is the thing with technology. Whenever you try to show it off just to other people, it always goes wrong. So it's always good to have a plan B. Let me just reopen my slides here and quickly share again with you. Sure. Mm. Where did that go? Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry. We're we're all we're all back on on the same other slide. Uh not yet it's appearing it says your screen share is loading your... yeah. are yeah. we okay yeah. great okay yeah. sorry about that 
I'm not sure what happened there, um, but anyway. So, so basically this is how AI actually works. It's, it's, a, it's not a complicated system. It's just the ability that it needs to assess itself and improve itself. Now, the other, the other elements that we need to think is that there's several types of AI, right? And these AIs you know, vary. And, and right now we're a very specific moment in the development. Uh, we have what we call the reactive AIs. And these are AIs to re that respond to changes. And this is a very example for that, the, kind of those AIs that play chess. So we've seen those AIs that play chess and they're, they actually beat the humans now, right? They're better than the humans playing chess, but these, oh God, no, this, this froze again, let me see. Hello? Are we okay? Yes. Sorry, I, I, my screen froze from, okay. This, there's something strange happening with my Zoom, I apologize. I'm not sure why that's happening, but sorry, I'm just going to reload my presentation because it's having some problems. Okay, let, let's hope this does not continue, but uh, just in case we will just share my screen again. Okay, this is not good. Okay. Sorry, my, my computer is crashing for some reason. Just one second, please. Uh, no worries, you can take the time. I apologize for this. This has not happened before, so I'm a, a bit disappointed that it's happening exactly right now. No, no, no problem. Okay, just to be safe, I'm probably gonna just share my, my without maximizing the image, just in case. All right, uh, yeah. It works better. Great, so are we all seeing the slides now? Uh, yes, but okay, from I, the first slide. I apologize for this. We might have, uh, we might, we won't be able to, to, to play some of the animations, but it should be okay. So basically uh, there are different levels of, of AI, but at this moment, our AIs are still very basic, right? So there's no AI that's gonna do everything and no, we are not in any danger of being replaced anytime soon, right? So still the AI technology has a long way to go. And uh, right now what we're seeing are very basic types of AIs that just have very specific functions and not more general AIs that are capable of doing more things. Now, there are a couple of important terms we need to be familiar with when we talk about AI. The first one is to understand first this concept of, of deep learning. So many times we hear people talk about deep learning. So deep learning is simply a, an application of AI technology to human type thinking problems. So getting the AI to try to copy the human mind. And that's basically what we call deep learning. Uh, we have neural networks, which are basically machines that are, are developed as a structure based um, similar to what the human brain is like. And that means many little neurons that are connected together. So AIs that have this design are called neural networks. We have natural language processing, and this is a type of AI that focuses on understanding human language. Right, so it's a tool that understands and analyzes human language. Uh, we have computer vision, and these are AIs that can see and are able to interpret images. And this is the ones that we see a lot being employed for radiology and some other types of visual things, also for self-driving cars. This is the type of AI that we see. Um, we have cognitive computing, and this is the AI that tends to try to simulate human behavior. And this is, for example, if you, if you look at uh, uh, things such as like Google, Google uh, Assistant or Siri in, in your iPhone or, or all these kind of personal electronic assistants are more a part of cognitive computing. And then we have machine learning, which is AIs that are able to, to learn from data without being explicitly taught. So they're able to learn by themselves. So these are some of those terms that you will frequently be hearing as you discuss about AI, and they're just different types of AI. 
Um, so it's really important to not, not get too uh, overwhelmed by the terminology. They're, they're just different types of AI and people use these terms sometimes to hide the fact that they're not so familiar with the product. So if somebody tries to sell you something with AI, they'll start using all these words, but it's, it's just, it's, a, it's all part of AI. Now, AI does have a series of very, very important challenges that need to be understood. And some of these can, can are, are, are very important. Like for example, one is the problem of uh, what we call the black box problem. This is a very common situation today. We have AIs that people don't understand the way they work. If you do not understand how the AI works, it's very hard to understand if the AI is making a mistake or not, right? And this is one of the reasons why doctors have been very hesitant to accept AI support in clinical decision-making because you know, if, if we don't know how the AI works, how am I sure if I can trust this AI? So that is what we call the black box problem, not understanding how the AI works. We have other issues, for example, still AI requires very heavy computing. So we need to have very powerful computers in order to, to run AI. So that makes the technology quite expensive and complicated. Uh, then integrating AI is quite challenging in terms of getting it to work in the real world. Designing an AI is not so difficult, but getting the AI to operate in the real world is very challenging. And that's something that we need to be, be aware of. Uh, still, there are many legal concerns about AI, right? Um, recently, there was a very interesting uh, news about somebody uh, entered a photo contest. And the photo that they entered won. And that photo was actually not a real photo. It was created by an AI. And it was the winner of the photo contest. So, you know, there, there's some questions. Is that is that ethical? Is it really okay? I mean... Uh, so these are questions that we really need to ask ourselves. Uh, other important thing is, for example, uh, many times we say, oh, yes, we want to use AI, but we don't really understand how that AI is going to be integrated. So for example, I say, oh, yeah, I want an AI that will check all my students' grades, but how is that AI going to actually be integrated? Are the students going to accept to be checked by an AI? You know, is it, is it, so the integration is something that we sometimes don't understand well. And then finally, the last thing is algorithm bias. And this is sometimes AI will make mistakes based on the data that they're receiving. So for example, if, if we are in the hospital and we get a patient come in that has cough, fever, and a sore throat, today, we immediately think about, oh, this could be COVID, right? We would probably send a COVID test. But if this had been five years ago, we would probably think, oh, this is influenza or this, is, or this patient has a cold. So sometimes when the AI uses just data, historical data to understand a problem, it might make mistakes. And AIs are not perfect by any means. They make mistakes just like everybody else. So it's really important to understand that these are some of these challenges that need to be understood from AI. Okay, so we just spent the, the last few minutes discussing about what AI was, we introduced a couple of very complicated words. And don't worry if you feel a little bit overwhelmed, that's normal. Uh, there are lots of terms that, that are difficult to understand, but uh, I think we can probably make these slides available if you want to check them later on. So no worries, we're gonna, so, but this is just a basic introduction into what AI is. And now let's get into, into something a bit more exciting. So AI education and AI for education. And this is kind of an important concept that we need to understand. There are two big needs right now in terms of how we're training our students. One is they need to understand what AI is because they're gonna use it in the future, right? So that's one important element. And definitely I think there's a very important role for us to be able to learn AI as medical students in order for us to be able to work in the future. But also is the use of AI for education. So how can we use AI to improve the way that we are teaching and learning. So these are two very different elements that are both AI related. So one is the students need to learn AI. Two is we want to use AI to improve education. So these are two kind of basic things that, that I'd like to address briefly today. So again, going back to this for AI education, we're parting from the need, from the understanding that 
tomorrow's clinicians, tomorrow's doctors and health professionals need to understand how AI works so that they can use it in their everyday practice. So they need to have a basic understanding of what AI is and what it does for them to be able to work tomorrow. If we are not providing this training to the students in the, as medical students, then they're gonna have a serious gap when they reach clinical practice because they're gonna be, um, we're gonna have to use AI, but they're not, they're not understanding how it works. So this is one important part that we need to consider. AI needs to be integrated in the curriculum. We need to have AI, AI learning as part of our education. Now, you're probably wondering why, why do we need to do that? Well, let me tell you the story of IBM Watson. Very quickly on the chat, how many of you have heard about IBM Watson? Yes or no? Have you heard about IBM Watson in the past? So I see a yes from Mohammed. Yes, several, a couple of no's. Yes, no, a couple of no's. Okay, so we have like a mixed group here. Some people have heard of Watson AI, some people have not. So I'll tell you the story about Watson AI and we're gonna, we're gonna learn a very important message from that. First of all, IBM developed this AI that was participating in game shows and the AI would win uh, over the human opponents because it, it was very good at finding information and, and, and kind of trying to find an answer to questions. So the AI was a very skilled AI at answering questions. And then it was very successful. And IBM was so excited. They said, okay, so this AI is going to be the future of medicine, right? So they had this idea that Watson would be the future of medicine because it can answer any question. We, it will find the data and answer the question. So that was the, the, the initial concept. And that's how AI was marketed. So AI was, was um, aimed to provide automated analytics that would allow doctors to diagnose more accurately, more quickly, and cheaper. So this is gonna save money, make things faster, and make the doctors better. So I don't know if somebody tells me that, I, I whoa, that, that's great, that's good news, right? We all want doctors that can diagnose more accurately. We want, all want doctors that can work faster and we all want doctors that are cheaper. So Watson was gonna revolutionize healthcare, right? Uh, also the, the Watson promised to, that treatments would more precisely target specific patients. So if we had a specific patient in mind, then Watson would be able to choose the best treatment for that patient given their conditions and their, their data. And then finally, um, the technology was sold as the solution to healthcare, right? So everybody was expecting the IBM Watson to completely revolutionize the way healthcare was provided and the cost of healthcare and the speed of healthcare. It sounded like a really, really cool thing. And universities and hospitals paid millions and millions of dollars for this product. So what happened next? Well, uh, there's a very interesting saying by Dr. by Sir William Osler, who's one of my favorite medical educators, that the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So on what we're trying to, to highlight here is that doctors aim to treat people, not disease, right? When we, we, we consider the human being, not, not just the condition that this patient has, but you know the actual patient, whether they have resources to buy the medicine, whether they have a lifestyle that can be improved. So there's several of these things that, that we need to really kind of have that understanding. Um, so what happened is Watson could never understand that. Watson was focused on treating the disease, not the patient. And the whole design of Watson was aimed towards that. So what happened is, is that you know, when, when doctors started disagreeing with what Watson was recommending, because Watson wanted to treat the disease as quickly and efficiently as possible, but did not understand the, the human side of doctor, right? And that is where the AI ultimately failed, right? And Watson was removed from hospitals and, and today is, is just kind of a little bit of a side note because 
it failed to understand the human element of providing patient care, right? And, and this is a very, very important thing. AIs meant to provide treatment need to understand what treating a human is like. And this is something that will not happen anytime soon. And I agree very much with a comment I'm seeing here on the chat uh, from Madiha, and sorry if I said that wrongly, but it says, I don't understand why AI or tech developers are obsessed with replacing doctors, right? And it's true, right? Doctors will never be replaced. Doctors will always have a role because we understand the importance of the humanity of our patients, whether the AI will not be able to do that. So what we're looking at is not AIs that are gonna do everything and replace the doctors, but we're looking at AIs that will have very specific functions in supporting the doctors to be able to spend more time dealing with the human side of, of care. So AIs can automate some of all those tasks that we do so that we can focus more on the human. And just let me, let me give you an example. If we have an AI that can write our clinical notes automatically, can you imagine if you didn't have to write any clinical notes anymore and spending that extra time connecting with your patient and helping them and hearing them out and understanding them, right? So then that's where we suddenly, oh, wow, that this could work, that this could be ex very exciting for us. So basically some of the key things that, that were learned from, from this Watson experience and why I wanted to share with you is that one is we, AI needs to understand the problem that we're facing. The problem is not replacing doctors. The problem is being able to automate so that doctors can function better. Uh, the other thing is AI needs to use high quality data in order to function. If I have an AI that is trained with American patients and I take that AI to Saudi Arabia, it will, will probably not be a very good AI, right? Because it doesn't understand the Saudi patient, right? And there are so many differences between patients in your country and patients in, in my country. Right, that that you know the AI needs to understand. Uh, the other important thing is again, we need to understand that things that are designed in theory don't work well in real life. Right, so in real life things are not perfect, and we will always find things that are that are that are different. Uh, then also we need to see that that you know we need to understand that AI is not perfect. AI makes mistakes too. So we need to have that mindset that understanding that AI you know, has, is not perfect, is not a perfect solution. And then finally, and probably most importantly, we need to train people, our students, our future doctors to understand AI and its limitations, right? So that way our doctors can know what is the problem that AI has so that I can be careful and see if that AI is making a mistake or not. I need to be able to evaluate the AI. And that can only happen if I understand what, how that AI works. So our students need to be taught how to do AI. And you're probably thinking, but wait, our, 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 our students are not IT specialists, they're doctors, right? But if you think about it, there is, there is some evidence before of learning technical things. For example, all of us understand how an MRI works, right? You don't need to understand how the MRI works to, to read the image, but we all learn in medicine and in medical school how the MRI works. What is the principle of, of, of the MRI? It's part of our training, right? Or for example, we learn how a PCR works. How is the PCR test performed, right? How the replication of DNA and all that happens so, so that we can, we can perform the PCR test. So shouldn't AI be the same? If AI is going to be a major tool in our future, we need to have a clear understanding of how AI works. Our students need to learn AI as part of the curriculum. So this is kind of one of those elements that we need to consider as we're moving forward. So this is AI education. AI education has a place in the medical curriculum. We need to learn AI. Now, the second element, and probably the other part that I'm most excited about because I'm an educator, is AI for education. So what can AI do to help me teach my students better, right? And, and this is an area where AI has huge potential and has not been explored too much in depth. So how can we use AI 
to train better doctors? How can we use AI to, to train better doctors and improve their performance? Um, so first, let me take you down to, to kind of what is our ideal dream of education. So adaptive learning has been something that we have been discussing for a long time. We want ways for the curriculum, the teaching methods, and the needs of our each of our students to come together in perfect synchrony. So we want the curriculum to match what our students need. We want the, the teaching and learning methods to match what our students uh, are better at. Some students are good at memorizing, some students are not. Some so the idea is we should be able to teach people differently based on how they learn, right? And that is kind of what we are hoping to achieve. But this is, of course, impossible. It's very difficult to do because we have so many students and it's impossible to customize the learning program for each single student. We just don't have the brain power to do that. Uh, now, this is where AI becomes very exciting, right? Because certain technologies can help us understand our students better and to modify the curriculum and teaching method to match that particular student. And we can do this through the use of learning analytics. So we can gather data about how our students are performing, how our students are learning in order for us to improve and change the way that they, they learn and what they learn. If a student is very quick to learn, maybe he doesn't have to go to medical school for five or six years, right? On the other hand, if some students need more time to learn, some students are, don't, earn that, that, don't learn that easily, right? And if you think about it, for example, uh, do most of you know how to ride a bicycle? Yes, no, bicycle? Yes, most people, yeah, different students with different abilities, yes. Some people, most people know how to ride a bicycle. Now, most people know how to ride a, bi ride a bicycle, but some people learned very quickly, right? Some people get on the bike and in two hours, they're riding that bike. On the other hand, other people like me, I fell down a lot, right? And it took me a very long time to learn how to ride a bicycle because I kept falling down or I had. So again, depending on the person, they might benefit from different types of teaching and learning. And, and that should be customized according to the person's characteristics. So artificial intelligence can help us understand that and can help us create learning plans to support our learners in learning. So one side is of AI is to see how we can use it to improve the learning process. On the other hand, is assessment. And this is where I'm most excited about AR is, you know, if we think about it, are doctors good assessors? Well, uh, usually when we do simulation, whenever we have a human assessor, that's the lowest integrator reliability, right? So humans, don't agree with each other on how they assess. Two people can look at the same student and have a completely different assessment of that student. So that's something to keep in mind, right? Um, on the other hand, we also know that sometimes it's difficult for us to complex, to integrate complex information data. When, when we're evaluating a resident or a medical student, we look at their test scores, but also we look at their workplace-based assessments. We're gonna be looking at the feedback comments that they receive. So it's really hard for us to, to bring all that data together and to make it, to make, to help us decide, oh, this student should pass and this student should fail. So it can be very challenging sometimes to, to understand like how all this data works together in order for us to understand performance, right? And also there, there's some challenges in, in being impartial, right? Sometimes we like some students more than others, right? And this is normal, right? Uh, so our perception of students can be biased as for our personal preferences in terms of their behavior and appearance. So all of these factors have a very big impact on the way humans score. And that makes us impartial, imperfect in scoring. We miss things, right? And it's just normal because if we think about clinical skills, clinical skills are not easy skills. 
they have a cognitive component. You need to have some knowledge to perform a clinical skill. There's a behavioral component. So you need to have certain behaviors to perform a clinical skill, like washing your hands regularly, you know, being careful not to contaminate something. And then there's psychomotor elements to it, right? The actual performing the task with your hands. So we are not only assessing one thing, we're, we're assessing different, very different elements that is very hard to do with our human mind. It's difficult to assess accurately a student because there's so many things happening at the same time. We're just looking at some of them. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how AI can help us in this case. So there are several ways in which AI can, can help us uh, improve education. One of them is in being able to, to analyze performance and develop a customized learning plan for our students. So the AI is able to understand where our students are weak and provide them additional training so that they can improve areas of deficiency. So this is a very important function that, that we see many, many times can be used, that we can use AI for. Other important thing is to keep track of data. For example, many times we give students feedback, and this could be verbal feedback that you give in the words or just have a talk, and this feedback is very often lost. Uh, so again, this is another important problem that we find, but AI is able to track that data using natural language processing. We can process all those conversations and summarize them so that we can all see what was discussed so far. Uh, we can also prioritize areas of learning based on standards. So we know that by graduation, we want all our students to have a basic skill level. So again, the idea is the AI can help us determine which areas the student needs to focus on in order to meet the minimum standards and be safe. So again, standard setting is something that AI can really be support. Uh, other areas, for example, is being able to track complex performance data, right? So if we think about how we evaluate a resident or a medical student in the clinical side these days, you know, we're using a lot of tools. We're using workplace-based assessments like the mini CEX, or we use 360 degree feedback when we get feedback from peers and nurses and teachers. We also have performance evaluations that they do. We have written tests. We, we have so many types of data that AI can help us kind of summarize and visualize in a, in a more effective way. And then finally, being able to visualize learning trends in large groups of learners, right? Because one thing is one student, but also we need to understand how are our whole group of students behaving and how we can improve our program based on their needs. So AI can be applied at many, many different levels in education. And this is where this is really an exciting technology. Right now, we're just using a very, very small part of this. So this is a huge area for future development and research. Now, is AI used today? Yes, we use AI today. There are many different applications of AI. For example, we have interactive virtual patients today. Uh, so th these are just software applications that are AI driven. And you can come in and you can talk to a a virtual patient, or you can type questions to a virtual patient and then have a conversation, right? So again, there, there's a lot that you can do. Um, also, for example, there are applications such as Quizlet. Quizlet is an app in which the students get multiple choice questions and based on their answers, we know what is correct and what is incorrect, the computer will decide what other questions to ask. So for example, if a student is answering very well in gastroenterology, but is not giving good answers in cardiology, then the system will give them more access uh, to cardiology. Okay, then there's some other interesting things. Uh, uh, chat GPT has been a big challenge. I see a couple of interesting comments there. It's not accessible and the, there's a dark side. Yes, there is a very dark side to GPT. Actually, we've had a lot of trouble because some of our students have started using it to answer the PBL questions. So the whole idea of PBL is being lost because of open of, of GPT chat. So, so this is definitely a, a big challenge, a big challenge that we do find and something that we do need to address in the future. 
So these are applications. Again, AI has good points, bad points, but we need to be able to balance that. Okay, so I realize we're kind of closing to to the to our time. So uh, a couple of things. So I think we can we can take a look at some of the questions at this moment. Um, also, uh, my contact information is on screen. If you would like to get in touch with me, you're very welcome to do so. And I would love to, to hear from you and continue the conversation because definitely one hour is a very short time to talk about AI. So thank you again for your attention. I hope this was interesting and not too confusing. And, and I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing from you as well. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daniel. I think that uh, the way you have taken us through, through the basic concept of AI and its application in education itself, that is amazing. That is wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, we should move ahead towards question. Yes, Dr. Khalid, uh, please uh, unmute and comment. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. It was really a very interesting talk. And I think it's stimulating uh, uh, presentation for us to think about uh, uh, how, uh, how we could uh, utilize AI in medical education. Um, I, I, I was uh, happy to address the, um, the issue of uh, technology, uh, especially the AI, uh, it's, it's not replacing uh, the human um, uh, expertise and uh, it's it's uh, rather complementing uh, uh, our our brains and our uh, skills uh, in 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 medical education i think it's um, uh, very important to adopt the new technology uh, very carefully and we have to weigh uh, between the benefits and the risk uh, so many things uh, in the past, um, uh, in the field of medicine, we are very careful. Uh, I remember when, when um, simulation-based uh, education uh, started in, in back in late uh, 60s, uh, nobody uh, in, in the medical schools uh, adopt this concept um, because they thought it's it's not useful uh, to replace the the human. But but now uh, uh, most of the um, uh, academic institutions they have simulation based um, technology uh, for education, and uh, they adopted this concept. Uh, uh, to, to be uh, as a complementary part of clinical training. Now, uh, as you mentioned, but some of the AI uh, may have drawback or, or a dark part of it, like the, uh, the Open GPT. And uh, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, we have to be careful on, on uh, uh, adopting or allowing our students to use it as uh, in other uh, specialties. Uh, so many universities now may uh, return back to uh, paper uh, and pencil uh, exams because uh, the overutilization of uh, uh, the chat GBT in, in answering essays uh, and this is uh, really, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say it's uh, a, a drawback, a big drawback uh, of this, unless we could uh, find the solutions uh, to make it uh, rather useful and with, a limit, uh, with certain conditions so that we can utilize it. Like in medicine, I think AI, uh, should be utilized effectively in some education like radiology education and uh, probably the, the uh, laboratory education, but not in all aspects of, of uh, medicine. What do you think, uh, Dania? Yeah, uh, Professor Khalid, so sorry if I didn't say your name correctly. Uh, thank you so much for that comment. And I think you are you're addressing a very, very important point we have concerns about this technology, right? The technology has some very interesting features and possibilities, but also we are worried 
you know, if, if what problems is this technology going to bring? Now, uh, in answer to that, there, there are a couple of important things we, we need to really be aware of is this technology change to AI is going to happen no matter what we do. AI is going to continue growing. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, there's financial reasons, there are, there are scientific reasons, but AI is not going to go away. AI is going to continue to develop and is going to become part of what we do every day. Um, so as educators, I think our goal is to try to understand what AI is so that we can better understand the risks. Uh, we don't, we want to be concerned about something, but we want to be concerned for the right reasons. So I think it's really important that we today need to educate ourselves on what AI is and how it works so that we can predict these risks and try to take measures on how to solve them, right? And I think uh, the, the chat GPT is a great example of that, right? We, we never, you know, we, we need to understand what it is and how it works so, so that we can understand how our students are using that and how we can mitigate some of that impact. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank, for yeah, thank you so much. So we are uh, running short of time and uh, very quick question we can take last, I can see one hand. So yes, please, you can unmute and can ask uh, Linodis and then we are going to end the session. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, lovely in all sorts of ways, especially identifying the potential drawbacks for integrating artificial intelligence into education, and more importantly, identifying the difference between AI education and AI for education. What I wanted to touch upon is with uh, the technology being as, as exciting as it could get, uh, in my understanding, uh, it would be, it's going to take a long path, but I think that AI could be integrated as complementary particle to the traditional education, which involves multiple choice questions, simulations, and so forth, because with curriculums and uh, methodologies, education methodologies varying across the countries, I've come across a lot of cases where um, internal medicine students or simply graduate students from medical colleges and universities either unfit or underprepared when they are being introduced to clinical practice or clinical rotations. So with the help of artificial intelligence, it could uh, basically improve their clinical reasoning through this repetitive uh, training. So this yes. could be the first step that artificial intelligence could be incorporated. Thank you. That's a, that's a great comment. And I, I agree with you. I think uh, AI still has a long way to go. We're just seeing the beginning of its development. And I think as it develops, we will start finding new tools and applications that could help us in education. But I think some of the very clear areas that we're looking at AI for is learner assessment, right? Because honestly, it's something we don't do well today and that we would really like to do better to ensure our patient's safety and our students' safety when they're going to learn in a clinical location. So I do agree that there's a huge role for AI in that field over there. So yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think most of the questions, uh, they have been already addressed in the presentation and we have recording. Definitely, we shall share this recording with you. And uh, Dr. Daniel, we shall highly appreciate if you can share slides because a lot of participants, they have commented that they need that. And with this, I, uh, I my apologies if we are not uh, addressing some questions uh, because we are running short of time and Dr. Daniel, he need to leave now. So, Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel, to give us time to assess me. Riyadh office, I hope that we shall invite you later on again because it is quite interesting topic. Sure, and, and thank you again for your time. I really appreciate you all being here and please, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm super happy. If you ever plan to, to come down to Cleveland, I'd love to, to have you here at, the, at, our, at our university. So, so please uh, let me know and uh, please take care and thank you so much again. For thank the you so much. Thank okay. you so much. Have a good Have day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.